we set sail for Lamalera, a small fishing village in Indonesia. Lamalera is on a mountainous volcanic island where the poor soil is not suitable for farming. Villagers depend for survival on a centuries-old hunting tradition, whaling. And their main target isn't just any whale. They hunt the sperm whale, the world's largest carnivore that can grow to a length of 20 meters and weigh up to 55 tons. La Malera is on the island of Limbato, one of the 17,000 islands that make up Indonesia. The earliest written record of this whale hunt dates back to 1643, when Portuguese explorers described it as heroic. People in La Malera have always subsisted on what the ocean could provide. But with no nearby reefs or shallows harboring fish colonies, villagers must sail far from shore to cast their nets in the deep ocean. For centuries, fishermen rowed out to sea in their frail craft, hauling in anything that could feed the community. But these meager catches were not enough to ensure the village's long-term survival. So they developed a whaling technique using handmade harpoons. But in the early 2000s, a sophisticated new piece of fishing gear was added to the tackle box, the outboard motor. There are now about 30 outboards, and they've completely transformed what villagers still call traditional fishing. Sharks, rays, and dolphins are choice targets, and much easier to catch with motorcraft. While they still use traditional boats to hunt the sperm whale, motorcraft help in various ways. We depend on sperm whales. We do catch dolphins and rays, but without the sperm whale, the community could not survive. That's why we all pray that the whales will come back year after year. Whales are vital for the inhabitants of Lamalera. Without them, we die of starvation. Long classified as traditional subsistence activities, hunting and fishing in Lamalera are not subject to any quotas or bans on harvesting for the protection of endangered species. This exception to international law has not been reviewed since the hunters began using outboards villagers still consider their practices as ancestral activities essential to their survival. Whaling season begins in May. The whole village gathers to pray and commemorate the souls of those lost at sea while working at this dangerous occupation. At the beginning of every hunting season, the first formal event is a get-together we call the beach meeting. We talk about various issues concerning the hunts to come. We might, for example, spend time discussing which team will harpoon first, second, and so on. We have to agree on that, or it will be a free-for-all. Then later that night, we make an offering of candles and flowers to the memory of those lost at sea. They are our heroes. May 1st is the day of the first whale hunt.
Pada saat itu juga setelah misa, the day begins with a blessing uh, of the boats ada and the men. Pemberkatan laut. Then all the fishermen go out to sea to do their job. Traditional boats called tena used to be propelled by oar or sail. But nowadays, the large craft are towed far out to sea, where the whales can be found. There's a ban on hunting blue whales. But we're allowed to catch sperm whales and orca. We are dependent on waves and plankton. If plankton is abundant and the waves head towards us, then the whales will come to us. If the waves go out to sea, the whales won't come. The harpooner stands on a small platform in the bow. He has to leap into the air to plant his harpoon in the animal's flesh. It's an art, and one with considerable risk. It's a difficult and dangerous job, and results in many casualties. I've been hunting whales my whole life. I started when I finished grade school, and I stopped three months ago, when I lost my leg. Some lose their lives. Others bear the scars of a battle lost in the name of tradition. During a hunt, there was a lot of confusion on the boat, and I ended up in the wrong place. I was standing with my leg in among the ropes when the harpoon caught in the whale, and the cable started to reel out, and I was thrown into the sea. When the cable between the whale and the boat tightened, it cut off my leg. It was a big whale, but we lost it. Whether the whale is large or small, it all depends on the harpooner. The harpooner is the most important person on the team. If you don't have a good harpooner, there's no point in going to sea. Even with a team of eight, nine or ten men, you have to have a good harpooner. A real harpooner has to be able to stand straight up at the front of the boat without getting nervous or feeling any fear when he sees the red eyes of the whale. A harpooner can't make a mistake. The rest of the team expects him to be successful no matter what. If there aren't many whales and I miss, I feel that I've let the others down. They rely on me. I feel an enormous sense of responsibility. It's a lucky escape for this killer whale. The harpoon fell out, and we're unlikely to see him again anytime soon.
The most remarkable thing I remember is the time I chased down and harpooned three whales, all in the same day. One of the whales was at least 15 meters long. All the boats were after it. Being a harpooner is a source of pride, mainly because it's a skill handed down from father to son. My father was not a harpooner, so I'm even prouder because of that. When we spot a dolphin, we come close and reduce speed so we can follow it. But it's tricky. Dolphins are unpredictable. They zigzag all over the place. I can catch up to 10 small dolphins a week. But if they're big, probably only five. The recently introduced use of motorboats has changed the way they hunt and greatly increased the pressure on a variety of vulnerable species. After another day hunting at sea, it's time to divvy up the catch among the crew. In a well-established distribution system, the harpooner and the boat's owner are allotted the best pieces. How do they eat that? Is it dry in, in the sun or? Bagaimana dimasaknya? Dikeringin dulu, baru dimasak. Tidak langsung. Ada yang kasih kering, ada yang langsung masak. Nak puasa. Okay. They can try it first, but it's, it's more delicious if you just uh, cook it right away. Obviously, for Westerners like ourselves, these images are very hard to accept because we have an almost emotional relationship with dolphins. When we come to places like this, I think we have to set aside our opinions, our Western point of view, to be able to understand this culture, even a little. But it's not easy. The numbers given by the harpooner are food for thought. If this one boat takes 10 dolphins a week, how many dolphins are caught every year by the Lamellera fleet's dozens of boats? And what is the impact on marine species now that motorboats are part of the hunter's arsenal? In this corner of the world, there are no scientists to track population numbers. Don't you think you're hunting too many dolphins? No, not at all. There will always be dolphins. Fishermen believe that their god knows what's good for them and would not put all these animals in their path if it wasn't right. Many boys aspire to the most prestigious job around. For generations, harpooners have commanded great respect here in the village because they contribute to feeding the whole community. For these youngsters, the dream of confronting a big sperm whale out at sea is very real. Oh, 
This is a day for celebration because they've just caught a young sperm whale. It's a young male. You can tell from the teeth. It's a male. Hard to tell the exact age, but uh, he's still fairly small. It's probably easier for them to catch the smaller ones. The main harpooner thrust the first harpoon into the whale. That harpoon is on a rope, and the rope is attached to a small wooden boat, which the whale now has to pull. Obviously, the idea is to exhaust the whale. Once the animal slows down, they'll come in closer and shoot more and more harpoons into it, attached to other boats. So by increasing the amount of drag on the animal and tiring it out, they'll eventually be able to deliver the dead blow. It's an ancient technique used by very few people anywhere in the world. It's been effective for who knows how many years, so they see no reason to change it. it was a difficult hunt. Is that so? Yes. It was very tough. Two of the 11 boats tipped. It took us an hour and a half to get the boats back in position. Other harpooners had to jump in to lend a hand. It was a difficult hunt. I'm a harpooner, and it's a dangerous job. So many things can go wrong. It's very risky. I could die at any moment. Is there more risk with a bigger whale? It's always risky, and accidents happen all the time. It doesn't matter how big the whale is. It's dangerous. We have to be really focused during a hunt. We harpooners have a rule. If we have worries at home, we do not go to sea. It's a lot safer. You don't want to take a chance. How many whales did the village uh, cut this year? This year, we've caught 25. 25? That's a lot, isn't it? No, it's not too many. If we could catch more, we would. We need them. They're our survival. We're not going to empty the sea by catching 25 whales a year. They're a gift from God. There will always be plenty of whales. We use every part of the whale. Nothing goes to waste. That shows just how much we need them. We have a saying here that goes, we should all have food to eat, not just our relatives, but everyone. When the pieces are cut out, the women roll them in salt and then hang them to dry. That way the whale meat will keep for months. Yeah, hello. The whales are our livelihood. We depend on them. A single whale will feed the community for a month. Half my share goes to my mother-in-law. 
I also give some to my neighbors and to the widows. We also traded for corn, one platter of corn for three strips of whale meat. Sometimes we also traded for bananas and manioc. The treasure will be divided according to a precise ritual. The crew that first harpooned the whale claims the choice pieces, but the whole community benefits from this manna from the sea. Tomorrow, the chief will come down from the village and the head will be set aside for him. The oil will be shared among the members of the village, but the head is always reserved for the chief. The next day, the villagers begin cutting up the sperm whale's head, which contains the precious spermaceti. So this is the head of the sperm whale with its single blowhole, which is to the right of center. That's typical. So the blow is always at a slight angle. They will cut off the part of the head that contains the spermaceti, a very valuable oil. Sperm whales are part of odontoceti, or toothed whales. They have only one blowhole, unlike baleen whales that have a double blowhole. The blowhole is off-center, and within the structure is where you find the spermaceti oil. When the whale is alive, its internal temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, so the spermaceti is in liquid form. Originally mistakenly identified as the whale's semen, the name sperm whale is derived from spermaceti whale. But below 30 degrees, the spermaceti solidifies into a spongy wax. The sperm whale controls its internal temperature and can alter the density of the spermaceti organ to act as ballast when diving. The oil can be burned in lamps and was used to light village houses right up to 2006 when electricity reached La Malera. At the end of the process, everything has been cut, dried, salted and stored. All that remains of the animal are a few bits of skeleton that the tide will soon wash out to sea. Life goes back to its usual slow pace until the next whale kill. This was the 25th sperm whale killed in just the last four months. At a conservative estimate, we're talking about several tons of food per slaughtered whale. In addition to the dolphins, rays, sharks, swordfish, and other fish caught every day. Yet. The total population, including the surrounding area, is no more than 2,000. Every Thursday, the women of La Malera attend a market in the neighboring village. Here they can pick up things they need that the ocean does not provide. The road linking the villages, not built until the early 2000s, affords a mobility that has begun to open up the world. Goods and commodities of all kinds can now be transported more easily, but it takes money to pay for them. While barter is still common, villagers increasingly want to sell their products for cash. In the market, we figured that a package of whale meat like this, that contains two or three pieces, is worth about one dollar. So whale meat is not uh, worth much compared to other types of fish or even some vegetable that are not very common here, like carrots. But what doesn't get sold, the woman will try to barter for something else. 
She's traded this for a root vegetable and she'll do the same here. It's really barter. They're trading root vegetables for pieces of whale meat. Not so long ago, whale meat was the basis of the local economy. But access to modern equipment and the free circulation of goods have altered life on this Indonesian island. Motorboats now set drift nets that catch vast numbers of fish. With modern technology being used to scoop up ever more marine life, some environmental groups have begun to question the legitimacy of traditions, especially where endangered species are concerned. When I look back and compare the situation now to previous years, I'd say the catch has really gone down since the late 1980s. As far as protecting species is concerned, it's a noble cause. But I firmly believe that the resource will be here for hundreds of years to come. We've always lived off what the sea gives us, and that includes whales. Some time ago, some people came to talk to us about protecting whales. But no one on Lamalera agrees with them. What we are doing is legal. The International Court of Justice permits our traditional hunting practices. We fishermen work very hard. Sometimes we work almost 24 hours a day. We will never stop hunting the way we do, the way we've always done. Not long ago, the local government tried to make us give up hunting, but we refused because this is traditional hunting and because all of the equipment we use is made by hand. No one can stop us from doing this. It would be an insult to our ancestors. It may be hard to accept that this can still qualify as traditional fishing especially compared to the way things were done before outboard motors came on the scene. They chase a killer whale, but the animal is fast. Dolphins. This time the boat was able to catch up to the fleeing animal. When we go out to sea and harpoon a dolphin, 
What we see is not a beautiful, intelligent animal. What we see more than anything else is an animal that, once we get it back to the village, will feed our families. We believe it's important to strike a dolphin's snout to shorten its suffering. That technique has been passed down from our ancestors. Disaster strikes. The motorboat has struck the harpooner, causing a serious head injury. John, can we go to Ulandoni, because the, the, the local hospital near nearby, like just in front of the of our boat? We quickly get the injured man to the village. On the way back, another unforgettable event brings a difficult day to a close. A crew member spots a familiar shape, and the boat makes straight for this shadow on the surface. The sight of an enormous manta ray sends the hunters into a frenzy. They struggle mightily to capture the animal. Since we arrived, we've been wondering about middlemen, foreign buyers who might be reselling some products of the marine harvest. But no one was prepared to discuss it. The standard response was that what happens here is subsistence hunting and fishing, not commercial. Our rescue of the wounded harpooner may explain his sudden and surprising willingness to talk. For us, Manta rays are a better catch than dolphins. In addition to their meat, there's also their gill rakers. The gill rakers bring in a lot. We get $50 a kilo for the gill rakers. We have a buyer here on the island. He sells them to a middleman who ships them to China. For shark fins, it's different. We have another buyer who ships them overseas. We get a lot of money for them, too. We know that Chinese importers pay a great deal of money for the gill rakers. Did you know that the manta ray gill rakers you sell for $50 a kilo go for $500 a kilo on the market? That's a big surprise. $500 sounds like a huge amount. But for us, $50 a kilo is still a tidy sum. The devastating effect of middlemen is well known. We've witnessed it firsthand in several countries we've visited, where locals sell products to international buyers for resale in Asia. The price for shark fins or gill rakers from rays is skyrocketing, as is demand. In China, too, tradition is trotted out as an excuse when these delicacies from the sea end up in soup. 
In less than 15 years, La Malera has undergone a dramatic transformation. A road has been built, electricity has been installed, and gasoline-powered outboard motors have made things easier for fishermen. Progress has opened up markets, and some local products now make their way to China. So it's been a good night's fishing on uh, La Malera. Here on the beach this morning, we find many different species, swordfish, mai mai, but there are also a lot of fish that are on the endangered species list. This morning, we see a number of species of shark. There are dolphins, a lot of rays, and especially hammerhead sharks. Worldwide stocks of hammerhead have dropped by 98% in the last few decades because of overfishing. But here there's an exception because of traditional fishing. It may be time to ask how far we're prepared to go in respecting cultures when we're talking about endangered species. We're also beginning to feel that uh, we're wearing out our welcome here in the village. I think they'll start urging us to uh, ship out pretty soon. They seem to be uh, more and more annoyed by the camera. So this may soon be the end for us on La Malera. In the US and in Japan, they use modern industrial fishing methods that really do endanger whales. That's not the case with us. But they want us to stop from hunting? Why don't they make them stop and leave us alone? If people think we're overfishing, they're not being fair. We go to sea to hunt in a traditional manner. We hunt and fish whatever we can find. If people are bothered by the way we do things here, that's their problem, not mine. Our point of view usually depends on our values and our culture. It's easy to condemn, and for many of us, often our first instinct. But putting an end to the whale hunt will have major social consequences here. On the other hand, can we accept the status quo with no scientific tracking and oversight? Beyond any ideological position, one question remains fundamental and universal. How far are we prepared to go in harvesting species that are threatened with extinction?